Five Live Formula One. I'm Harry Benjamin, and this is Five Live Formula One, where it's the Belgian Grand Prix, and it's a sprint weekend. As such, we've actually just seen Max Verstappen take the fastest lap in qualifying, but because of his five-place grid penalty, Charles Leclerc will start from pole position for Sunday's race. To reflect on that and to look ahead to the weekend, I'm joined for the next 25 minutes or so by the former Renault Formula One driver, Jolien Palmer, former McLaren mechanic, Mark Priestley, and the BBC's chief F1 writer, Andrew Benson. Uh, Jolie, before we get stuck into qualifying chat, you've raced this Spa circuit. Can you just paint us a, a bit more of a picture of, of how, how nice this track is? Oh, it's beautiful. One of the classic circuits, 19 corners, some iconic names amongst them, Eau Rouge, Pouin, Blanchimont. Uh, super fast, really flowing track, uh, very steep uphill for the first couple of kilometers of the seven, and then a nice descent to, uh, to the bus stop. A couple of good overtaking places. You know what, Harry? It's a track that's got it all, I'd say. It is a fantastic track, especially in the challenging conditions as well. It really sees the drivers uh, have to go through it all. Uh, but I mentioned right at the start, it is a sprint weekend, which does change the format up slightly, Mark, doesn't it? So uh, today we went straight into it with just the one practice session. Yeah, very wet practice session as it was. And then into qualifying this afternoon, which is the qualifying to set the grid for Sunday's Grand Prix. So that's your typical qualifying session that we normally would have on a Saturday afternoon. On a Saturday for a sprint weekend, of course, everything changes. And Saturday kind of becomes its own standalone day with a, a shootout, effectively a qualifying session on Saturday morning, which sets the grid for the sprint itself, a shortened Grand Prix or shortened race, if you like, on Saturday afternoon, known as the sprint. So that's a Saturday all on its own, has no bearing necessarily on Sunday, unless, of course, you write your car off at some point on Saturday. But it's a standalone day. So today's qualifying sets the race grid for Sunday. Tomorrow is all about the sprint. Absolutely. Well, uh, it very much is a, a sprint Saturday, isn't it? But uh, we have had qualifying for the Grand Prix uh, just finished uh, in Spa, and it was uh, Max Verstappen who was fastest eight tenths of a second, over eight tenths of a second, Jolien. He won't start on pole on Sunday, as I said, because of the grid penalty. But once again, a mighty display from the two time champ. Yeah, uh, shock horror. Verstappen wipes the floor with everyone in 2023. But uh, I have to say this time it, it wasn't as straightforward as eight tenths gap might seem. It was a one last lap, really, where Verstappen went to the top. Apart from that, it looked like it was anyone's game. Uh, but the track dried out. The more it dried, the more it suited the Red Bull car. And, and then, of course, Verstappen was the, was the man to do the job right at the end. He nearly got knocked out in Q2. That would have been the big story if he didn't make it into the final part. Once he did, uh, Pole was there for the taking and he grasped it, as we're quite used to. Yeah, it really seemed like uh, Q3, the build-up, was going to be the big crescendo. But, Andrew, it didn't quite happen in the end. The end of Q2 was probably a little bit more exciting than the end of Q3. But for the, for the first time in, in a little while, we went into qualifying with the changeable conditions, really not knowing who was going to come out on top. Did we, Harry? Yes, did we, we did. Really? Yes, we did, Andrew. <laughs> Ever the cynic. Ever the cynic. <laughs> well, come on. Look, I mean, I Hamilton think... took pole last time and that surprised us all, but we all thought it was going to be Verstappen in Hungary. That's true. I mean, we think it's going to be Verstappen everywhere, don't we? I mean, look, let's be honest. The jeopardy has kind of been taken out of Formula One a bit this year. Jolien is right, though. It, uh, there was some jeopardy for Max Verstappen in the second part of qualifying and we could tell that not only by the fact that he was 10th and only just sneaked through into the into the top 10 shootout in that session but he then had an argument on the radio with his engineer Giampiero Lambiesi about the run plan whether they should have done this this or the other um, in terms of fast laps in consecutive times or, or what uh, so that does go to show that they were struggling a bit in those conditions Actually, even on the first runs in Q3, Verstappen wasn't fastest either. That was Leclerc. Who, this was a very impressive performance by Charles Leclerc, by the way, who's in, who was struggling in these sorts of damp conditions a couple of races ago. Um, but Verstappen pulled it all out in the end, as I think he always was going to, just as he's always going to win the race from sixth on the grid. But I think the, the races are more of a given at the moment, but qualifying pace looks like it's, it is more open. And it, it really looked like Leclerc could have had it. It looked like Oscar Piastri was absolutely flying in the McLaren and the difference was we only had an hour's practice earlier on and we didn't even really have that because it was soaking wet no one did more than a couple of wet laps so when you have a sprint weekend and you have 
no practice really in dry conditions, you can't guarantee that even the best team with the best driver is going to turn up and have top spot because sometimes you need to dial in your car. And it looked like Red Bull were maybe struggling a little bit in the in the dry conditions initially. But then, of course, Max delivered and proved Andrew Benson absolutely right. <laughs> but I think that was it. It was the unpredictability. It wasn't necessarily about the pace of the cars. And that's what a weekend and a, certainly a day like today when the, the conditions are so treacherous and changing so rapidly, it's, it almost takes away the natural running order or the natural performance order of the cars because then it comes much more and Julian you know this better than any of us it comes down to what the driver can do behind the wheel in that moment how much risk are they prepared to take you know how confident are they in that car in those conditions on the the dry tires with very damp sections of the circuit and that's what I loved about today that's what made it unpredictable and that's why we went into the the qualifying sessions not really knowing if there was going to be a surprise I know that if you just look at the time sheets now it looks like any other qualifying qualifying session but I'm not sure that was the whole story being told in the timesheets as it finished well the more it dried up the more we got back to convention didn't yeah, we and we true. had Red Bull looking stronger and and in the end unbeatable I mean they could have done another few laps and no one's touching that Verstappen time bearing in mind Max would be improving as well so in the end it got basically down to a dry track with a couple of slippy parts in the middle sector but the whole way through to get there I'm actually surprised we didn't have more thrills and spills. We had a couple of, we had Ocon and Magnussen hit the wall. Um, we had a couple of slides, but there wasn't any huge drama on a track that does have a, a lot of high speed corners and, and barriers pretty close. Yeah, they all kept it fairly clean, didn't they? Uh, well, let's hear firstly from Max Verstappen, who went quickest, uh, but takes that five place grid drop for uh, going over his gearbox allocation. Uh, he spoke with uh, Le Mans legend Tom Christensen straight after qualifying. Yeah, the pole man, the dominator, the world champion. What a lap you put in in the end. And you were nearly out during Q2. It was really close at that point. Yeah. How did you see it all? Yeah, it was uh, very tight. Um, of course, the conditions, you know, they are very tricky. The track was really drying quickly. And uh, yeah, my final lap, I just didn't have that confidence in Q2 to, uh, to push more. And I was very lucky to be in P10. Um, but then, yeah, of course, in Q3, you have two tire sets. You know that you can push a little bit more. You can risk a little bit more. And uh, that's what we did on that, on that final lap. And, uh, yeah, to be on pole again, I mean, I know that I have to drop back on Sunday with the penalty I have, but it was the best I could do today. And where was it where the, the car really came alive? You were purple sector, all three sectors on your last flying lap. Just put it, put, pushing at the limit or over the limit or just like normal? I, I guess sector two was still a bit damp, you know, so there was only like really one dry line or in some corners you had to do a bit of an alternative line to normal in the dry. And it was all about just yeah, feeling confident and, and basically risking everything in, in that final run to, to get more lap time. And yeah, we know that the car was quick and I think um, even with these tricky conditions today, luckily we, we could show that again. Yeah, looks like we have to find some rain tires for tomorrow, but you for the Grand Prix on Sunday, you have the five grid penalties due to the gearbox. How do you foresee the weekend? I mean, last year I had more penalties and we could still win the race, so that's still the target on, the, on Sunday. But yeah, let's first see also tomorrow what uh, the weather will do and what kind of racing we will have. Sounding cool, calm and collected as ever. But Max Verstappen then uh, taking pole on the road, but with that grid penalty, uh, will drop down five positions, but will be looking for his 44th career win on Sunday. But Andrew, with, with this grid penalty that he's taken because he's gone over his gearbox allocation, why has he done that here at the Belgian Grand Prix? Well, Red Bull haven't actually said, but the suspicion is that they uh, were not going to make it through the season um, on their allocation of four gearboxes. Um, and so they've taken the penalty at a track where, um, you know, it's easy to overtake. And Verstappen proved that. I mean, he made it look even easier to overtake than it really is as far last year when he came through from 14th on the grid um, to win. Um, but I think they've taken the lessons from that and thought, well, if we're going to have to take a gearbox penalty, let's get it out of the way at the track where it's le likely to be least damaging. And that, they think that'll be this one. And it's almost proved to be the case, hasn't it? Because Max was able to put it on pole, which minimises the, the negative effects of that grid drop. It's a circuit that suits their car very high speed. And as you say, they can overtake. So I think the reality is they could have probably taken it anywhere and still found a way to get to the front, such is the advantage. But I guess this minimises the, the deficit that comes from it well uh, with the penalty that of course means Leclerc will take his 20th career pole and Julian actually as as Andrew mentioned right at the start 
Leclerc was looking really pacey throughout qualifying and particularly we started off quali in those tricky conditions where it was damp, it was the crossover uh, in the conditions going to dry where Leclerc has traditionally so far this season struggled quite badly in his Ferrari. So it, it's a good turn of form for him. Yeah, a couple of months ago, he'd have been shuddering at the thought of having a slicks in the damp qualifying and he was out in Q1, wasn't he, in Barcelona and other places, even Austria, a couple of races ago. In the dry, was flying on the front row and when it rained for, for the sprint qualifying, he was, uh, he was a bit further back. So he's really got on top of it. He's worked really hard on this area that's been a weakness for him so far this year, basically getting the tyres fired up. He's a driver that's got a lot of skill. But if you don't get the tyres fired up, you don't feel the grip, you don't have the confidence. And that's what he's worked on. And he delivered a really, a really good lap. He's less than two tenths of a second quicker than Carlos Sainz, but he's three places further up. So the whole field after Verstappen is, as usual, really close. But typically, Verstappen has a massive margin and, and everyone else behind is, is fighting around for the scraps behind and they're really close. But Leclerc did a great job to at least beat Perez and he'll be on pole. How many times do we have to say if you take Verstappen and Red Bull out of it? It's really, really tight. Uh, well, we'll chat more about Leclerc in a minute, but let's hear what he uh, had to say first. Uh, again, speaking with Tom Christensen. Charles, it was a fantastic qualifying for all of us watching. And now P2, which will be pole on Sunday. Yeah, not a bad qualifying for us, uh, especially in those conditions. Uh, it's always tricky to put everything together. Um, I've put a lot of work in, in those conditions as I wasn't really comfortable a few races ago, and it seems to pay off. Uh, we went a bit too early for that last run. My pole was uh, definitely not for us today, and Max was too quick, but uh, we could have been a bit uh, closer. Having said that, we have a great uh, starting position for Sunday, and, uh, um, and yeah, let's see how it goes. We really see, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of great images in the background. I mean, you were you were pushing. You could see you really dancing with the car, trying to extract the most. Particularly Q2, where everyone just improved during the last seconds. It was really tricky. I uh, I had Kevin also that went uh, in the wall and then uh, continue in front of me. Uh, so I didn't put a lap in early, and then you've got all the pressure on that last lap that you need to. Uh, to put and in those conditions it wasn't easy but uh, at the end everything went well so uh, um, yeah happy uh, having said that there's still quite a bit of uh, work to do in order to catch the Red Bulls so Andrew in this ever revolving door right now of who's the second fastest team on the grid it's Ferrari at the moment who seem to, to have the edge so far in Spa is that fair to say well, in, in one lap, uh, Harry, yes. But um, one lap has been where Ferrari have been strongest this year. They've actually, on average, got the second fastest car. But they're nowhere near second fastest in the championship in terms of points in either the drivers or, or the constructors. So th they're really struggling in the races, um, which I think is why Leclerc sounded a bit downcast or downbeat, at least, um, after qualifying. He knows that forget about Verstappen coming through to win the race. He knows he's going to have his work cut out to keep a number of the drivers behind him still behind. And I don't think he probably rates his chances that highly of doing so. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's good news for uh, Leclerc. It's his first pole in inverted commas of the year. Well, it is a pole uh, in, in reality. Um, he's, you know, some people think he's the fastest driver over one lap in Formula One. Um, but he's not had much chance to show. He's had a difficult year. Things haven't really gone his way on a number of different levels. So um, maybe this will be a bit of a boost for him ahead of the summer break. Yeah, he has a habit of performing well on, on sprint weekends as well, of course, taking taking pole uh, back in Baku as well for the, the, the sprint weekend too there and having a good run of it in, in Austria as well. Uh, but he will inherit pole position uh, for Sunday's Grand Prix. Alongside him, Jolian, will be Sergio Perez, much better from the Mexican in recent times. He had a little bit of an improvement in Hungary, but he still started down in ninth. This is, this is what Red Bull want to see all the time, surely. Yeah, much better from Perez. I mean, there's a, still a gap to his teammate, but at least he'll be on the front row where Max is uh, is going to be absent with the, with the grip penalty. So it's what Red Bull want. I imagine Perez will have the race pace to beat everyone that's not Max Verstappen from uh, from where he starts. He's come through pretty well from further back in, in recent races. Uh, and if you consider Budapest is a pretty difficult circuit to overtake, and he went from, what, ninth to third. So starting second... He'll be definitely aiming to finish in the top two. And that's what Red Bull want. So just alleviating a bit of pressure on his shoulders. You know what? I can't believe. Ferrari have only had two podiums this year. 
both for Charles Leclerc. One was in Baku, where he took pole. The other one was in Austria, so they're both the two sprint weekends. For all the pace and they've been nibbling away, think of all the podiums that Alonso's had this year. Uh, McLaren now have had two podiums in the last two races. They've only had two podiums, which shows how, how their race pace does just drop away. Yeah, it's a massive weakness for them, isn't it? And I, I actually think they're going to struggle here to some extent. You know, they, they, this is a circuit, as we keep saying, that you can overtake on. There's going to be a lot of faster cars coming through. We know the Red Bull's very quick in a straight line. We've got but two of those that are behind Charles Leclerc that could easily find their way past along the straights. Uh, I think Ferrari got a lot of work to do to get better on a Sunday. And of course, that's where the points are dished out. So they have to put that work in. That's got to be their focus. I think one of the interesting things tomorrow... How much of a fight is Sergio Perez going to put up when, when his teammate almost inevitably finds himself behind the rear wing? Yes, we know how good the, the DRS system is, so I'm sure Max will find a way past, but how feisty is Sergio going to get when he's in this phase of his season when everyone's starting to talk a bit negatively? He's kind of got to get his elbows out a bit, hasn't he? He'll well, put, he'll put over. Is, <laughs> no, the problem is you, he probably won't have a choice, guys, because it's such a, an easy-to-pass track. You've got the huge run out of uh, out of Eau Rouge, up the Camel Strait. You get slipstream into Eau Rouge. You yeah. get DRS on the top of it. If this happens quicker, no one's got a hope of keeping him behind. And that's that's the reality of this circuit. You've got DRS into La Source. There's overtake opportunities everywhere. It's bad news for Perez if Verstappen's coming through. It's bad news for everyone if Verstappen's <laughs> coming through. But it's also bad news for uh, for Leclerc because starting ahead with race pace that's not so good, yeah. he'll probably be looking over his shoulder at uh, Lewis Hamilton, I'd have thought, who'd be really eyeing up that podium spot. Well, it's uh, Perez's first front row start since pole in Miami nearly three months ago. So uh, hoping for a good start off the line for the Mexican. Uh, behind him was Lewis Hamilton, the Mercedes, Carlos Sainz, the Ferrari, Piastri and Norris, the two McLarens, Russell Alonso and Stroll, uh, the top 10. And uh, maybe it's just worth saying, uh, Andrew, on the Mercedes and the McLaren sort of tail of two halves, McLaren were looking really quite pacey we in the commentary box we thought piastri might well get pole position at one point in the early part but uh, having to settle towards the lower end of the top 10 uh, for those two so slightly dis slight disappointment from from the mclarens yeah the, the question mark we've got over mclaren is piastri was the quicker driver all the way through the session but norris uh, had an off quite early on in the first part of qualifying he went uh, wide at uh, what's now called curve paul frere but i think most people know is stavolo two the one onto the back long back straight through blanchiment to the chicane went through the gravel bounced around a bit uh, was lucky to keep it out of the wall and we saw the mechanics in the mclaren pit working on that floor through the session so i suspect he had damage um, all the same, very impressive performance from Piastri uh, in the second McLaren, uh, who is justifying their decision to get rid of Daniel Ricciardo last year and bring him in. He's, he's coming on uh, uh, quite impressively as the season develops. Did yeah. that Norris moment remind you of any other moments this year in qualifying, Andrew? Similar uh, conditions? Yeah. Alonso at the last there corner we in go. Spain. Yeah. There we go. Exactly. And, and he struggled after, didn't he? Alonso, was uh, that was his worst qualifying at the time. I think he was ninth or tenth. He I think did. ninth. The floor is such an integral, important part of this these modern Formula One cars' performance, and particularly on a circuit like this, which is high speed and all about low drag. So if you lose a little bit, a little turning vein, a little flick from underneath the floor, there might be tiny little pieces of carbon fibre, but if you lose one, you know, they're all there for a reason. They do start to really impact the performance of the car more than they have done in the past. Yeah, and that's that, that race in Spain was actually the first time we saw the beginnings of the slump in form from the Aston Martins, which have continued uh, through the, the last few races and into this weekend, even though they've got a, an upgraded floor this weekend. Uh, Alonso and Stroll, ninth and tenth. Alonso a second quicker than Stroll, just behind George Russell in eighth place. So they've got some work to do to, um, to bring that car back to the front uh, in the second half of the season, if they can manage it. Uh, conversely, Piastri was really good today and McLaren actually said after Hungary they found damage to his floor and that's why he dropped back as much as he did through the, the last Grand Prix. So I'm really impressed with Oscar Piastri. He's running Norris so close. He's taken on from Daniel Ricciardo and he's really taken that second car to be 
fighting to be a first car and it's his rookie season so I think he's done a terrific job it certainly was uh, fun to watch in qualifying wasn't it well that was qualifying and Max Verstappen although on the road setting the fastest lap with a penalty Charles Leclerc will start Sunday's Grand Prix from pole position alongside Sergio Perez but we've still got a lot more to look forward to this weekend because it is a sprint weekend as well so all that action basically gets going on a, on a Saturday as uh, Mark outlined to us right at the start of uh, the show uh, we had the sprint shootout basically qualifying for the sprint race on the same day and Jolien is it going to be kind of business as normal the weather we don't we're not quite sure what that's going to take a turn for are we expecting more rain uh, you're asking the wrong guy Harry well, I uh, thought you're the I one who always says you know what the weather's going to be well Let's be honest, it's Spa. It can <laughs> rain at any given moment around there. So I think there's going to be some weather in the air tomorrow, but uh, whether or not it will hit for the, at the crucial times, we'll, we'll see. It won't matter for who's going to be at the front, though. In fact, Verstappen is on such form. He doesn't have a grip penalty for tomorrow. Tomorrow is a brand new day, just entirely on itself. A sprint, uh, the shootout, and then the sprint. And Max is on a relentless run. He'll want to be winning. And rain or dry... He's going to be the favourite, isn't he? I hope it does rain. I hope it's like today where it's changeable. You know, I think Formula One, for all the complaints Formula One gets in the modern day about there being some level of predictability about the result, that's the one thing that we can almost guarantee has the ability to mix up that result. And that's a bit of rain. And we saw a little bit of it today. It didn't quite pan out because it dried out towards the end. But if we do get rain at the right time tomorrow, this could be a spectacular sprint day. It's going to be the, the third sprint uh, that we have this season after uh, Austria and Baku. Andrew, oh, is Formula One happy with, with how the sprints are going in terms of the format? We know they're, they're tweaking things. We know they like to, to try things out and then redo things. It seems to be that we're moving in a, a good direction when it comes to the sprints. So um, there's no question at all about the sprint staying on the Formula One calendar. Um, I don't think it'll ever be um, everything you know it won't be every race a sprint um, I have heard rumours about Formula 1 wanting to have 8 sprints next year or maybe they'll stay at 6 the drivers are happy for the sprint weekends they like the way it changes things up a bit but they're, all of them pretty much unanimously say they wouldn't want it to be every weekend um, whether if Formula 1 had their own way completely they would change it so it's every <laughs> Grand Prix uh, is a different question but that's not the way it's going at the moment. Well, the, the thing I love about it, Jolien, is that it gets you straight into the weekend, straight away. Because although it is, you know, the sprint is isolated now on a Saturday, you're straight into practice and it really limits the drivers in, in, in how much they can get out of practice. Because especially if you're bringing upgrades, you've got to get everything in that one and only practice session. Otherwise, you're going to be on the back foot. Yeah, it, it definitely adds a bit of pressure, adds a bit of jeopardy in the, the sprint qualifying tomorrow. It's a bit shorter. So if it does rain or changeable conditions, it will probably have a bigger effect because around a long lap, it's going to be difficult to pit and change tyres as easily. Uh, I really enjoyed it in Austria when it was a dry weekend with one wet day as a sprint because it felt like a different circuit. It was a very different outcome. And we had a pit stop in the sprint as well, which livened things up. Um, overall, I'm... A, I'm I like that every session counts, even your one hour of practice generally counts in the sprint. But then there is the, the flip side of it is if Max Verstappen dominates in the dry tomorrow and then we have a dry Sunday, we get a teaser of what's going to happen. And it will be uh, uh, quite a gloomy outlook for the driver that ran away by 33 seconds for the last Grand Prix. So um, it, it gives you a bit, of a, a bit of a taster of what's to come for the Grand Prix if the conditions are the same. But it's Belgium, it's Spa, and probably you won't get two conditions the same all weekend. And I would imagine that the, the way Formula One look at this when they're deciding about whether it's a success or otherwise, whether they want more of them or less of them, they will be looking at this from the commercial point of view. They're the commercial rights holder of this sport. So if more people are watching on a sprint weekend, if it generates more interest in the social channels and all of the other things that they, they measure as deemed to be a success or otherwise of their product of Formula One, they're going to want to do more of it. And so... 
If Andrew is correct and they're looking to up the number, that's because it's working at some level in the background and they're not going to go against that. Well, we have three more sprints to look forward to after this. Qatar, uh, Austin, Texas and Sao Paulo in Brazil. So three more to come after this before the season's end. Um, we mentioned earlier as well this sort of revolving door and, and the battle for second place. Uh, Andrew, one of the teams that's fallen to the back of that pack and arguably detached is Alpine. And normally at this time of year, it begins to get a little bit driver silly season, lots of rumours going about, but it's sort of becoming more of a team principal silly season because there was some huge breaking news that happened just after uh, we all came off air for practice involving Otmar Zaf now, the team principal, and Alan Permain, uh, the, the team sporting director at Alpine. Both of them announced as out. I don't know so much about revolving door, Harry. It's more like an out-of-control elevator that the cables have snapped <laughs> on at Alpine at the moment. It's, um, they look to be in complete disarray. It's only a couple of weeks since Laurent Rossi, who um, was made the CEO when uh, the Renault team was renamed as Alpine, was moved into what they call special projects, which <laughs> people mean is a quick, sharp kick up the backside off into the touchline. Um, and now, uh, then they made another management change a couple of weeks ago, in, uh, in, uh, creating a new role of uh, head of Alpine Motorsport which was given to a guy called Bruno Famin who previously headed the engine department and now they've uh, got rid of they say by mutual consent but I'm not sure how much mutualness there really was in it but of Otmar Zafnar and Alan Pemain now it was quite embarrassing for Bruno Famin he sat in the team principal's uh, press conference near Christian Horner a couple of hours ago and Horner was going on about what a uh, wonderful character Alan Pemain was how he'd been a sort of centrepiece of that team for 34 years and he wouldn't wouldn't think he'd be unemployed for long and this is a guy who Faman's just got rid of I don't quite know how they think they're going to go around restructuring that team without a team principal or a sporting director um, and the guy who's just run an engine division uh, but um uh, yeah, they're, they're in disarray at the moment. And uh, also they've lost another senior figure, it's turned out this weekend, Pat Fry, their chief technical officer. Um, it's, it isn't, it's not part of the same shake-up. This is Pat Fry's own decision. Uh, a couple of months ago, it turns out, he decided to join Williams, and that was announced today uh, as well. Well, it's all going on at Alpine, isn't it? Uh, and you can keep abreast to all of the fallout for that as well across the uh, BBC Sport website. But we are dramatically running out of time. So uh, before we go, from each of you, please, I want your one, two, three for Sunday's Grand Prix. Jolien, first up. Uh, Verstappen, Perez, Hamilton. OK, Mark? That's what I was going to say. I'm going to go Verstappen, Perez, Oscar Piastri. Oh, nice. Andrew? Uh, Verstappen, Perez, Leclerc. Let's give him a third podium, of the, uh, whatever, third podium of the year. Uh, well, look, thank you, uh, gents, for, for joining me. We are just out of time. My thanks to Jolene Palmer, Mark Priestley and Andrew Benson. There's live commentary of the Belgian Grand Prix this weekend on Five Live, starting with the sprint race tomorrow from 3.30. Then on Sunday, it's race day, and we'll be with you at 2 o'clock. Up next, though, on Five Live, we're crossing over uh, for second half commentary of Super League action between St. Helens versus Leeds Rhinos with Dave Woods and Stefan Ratchford. That's to come after your latest news headlines. Uh, but for now, this has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live.